Thanks everyone for coming out. Um, welcome to uh, Earth vs. the Giant Spider, amazingly true stories of real penetration tests. Um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Rob Havelt and I'm the uh, Director of Penetration Testing for uh, Trustwave Spider Labs. Um, over to my right, or left, my other right, <laughs> <laughs> is my Brazilian friend Wendell Enrique. Wendell, you want to yep. introduce yourself? Uh, I work on the Trustwave Spider Labs penetration team uh, for almost two, three years, I guess. Uh, I have over uh, 90 years on the security industry. I have found some vulnerabilities in different set of products, uh, web application firewalls, camera, remote application systems, and probably uh, a lot of others. Uh, I already presented at Black Hat, DEF Con, OASP, and some other uh, big conference. Uh, we are in the process of getting a patenting pending technology for a penetration test project we did and the, a few other things. That's me. And like I said, um, I'm the, the director of pen testing at Trustwave Spider Labs. I've uh, been around the security industry kind of forever. Um, I've worked uh, from starting up an ISP to um, doing TSCM to just about every possible job in system administration and information security. Um, I've uh, spoke at a lot of venues and, and this is a, a great opportunity uh, for us to uh, <clears throat> speak at, um, to you guys at uh, probably one of the best security conferences ever, DEF CON, and the greatest crowd. Um, so what's this all about? <clears throat> Basically, we put together a um, <clears throat> collection of the weirdest, freakiest, and most unlikely hacks that we've ever found. Um, and we'll, in, we'll walk you through like these weird, freaky, unusual, just out of the ordinary stuff. We'll let you meet the, uh, the victims of these odd hacks because some of these actually have uh, serious implications. And, um, you know, we'll uh, kind of walk you through a few of these things and, um, and kind of wrap it up after that. <clears throat> so, um, basically, <clears throat> we had to, we've been in a unique opportunity to see, like, some very real, interesting, uncommon, and, and very non-trivial things that can't really be found either using traditional like attacking methods, i.e. like, you know, vulnerability exploits um, or straight on technological methods or even like ways that make sense and follow the laws of, seemingly the laws of physics. Um, and um, we've done this because we, you know, we have a huge team that does like more than like 2,300 penetration tests in a year. Um, but only the coolest and freakiest stuff were selected to uh, present to you guys. So by the end of this presentation, uh, we hope to have you thinking about these systems and applications that organizations use every day and, and how <clears throat> even like the most basic things, security, um, security tools, um, security systems, uh, coffee machines and things like that might be used against them. So, on with uh, Earth versus the giant spider. Do you okay. want to talk about sure. this one? Uh, this case is a big network restaurant franchise uh, around the world that sells food over the internet. Uh, they, they have some good maturity of security so, for example, on the application, we couldn't find any cross-site scripting, cycle injection, or things like that. Uh, the application was basically uh, created in Java and Flash, and the no common parameter manipulation uh, was working, uh, for example, in, uh, including negative values on products and things like that. However, during the transaction, uh, we detected that uh, um, the checkout was redirected to a third-party gateway, uh, and this gateway, when get this information, processed it and sent the information to a to a security channel uh, directly 
to this company and they just got a response like approved or not approved. So uh, what we did is manipulate uh, these requests to change the, the final val value of the transaction itself uh, on the gateway since it was a directory over JavaScript from our browser by the main application. Consequently, uh, the final price that appeared on the website and the, all this stuff uh, was the real price of the products. Uh, but when we conclude the transaction, we could put any kind of price that we would like. Uh, and they just got uh, accepted or not. In this way, you could get almost any kind of food for any value. Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, Do you have them? Here. No, I don't have it. Okay. So Never mind. Different. Okay. <clears throat> so, in summing up, what, you're, you're talking now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Talk to them, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, basically, uh, as a result of this penetration test, we could got, get some uh, good amount of food delivered to our home with almost uh, 50 cents uh, at the end of the engagement. One of the cool things was we actually did engage a delivery driver that uh, came out with the bags of food and everything like that and yeah. took a bunch of pictures. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it was um, all kinds of fun. But it's just a weird uh, thing that, uh, you know, and, and kind of a, a bad thing to do to let somebody kind of manipulate things and just kind of trust that uh, everything's happening behind the scenes the way it should be. So um, <clears throat> moving on. Um, <clears throat> okay. So this one was, uh, we're called the one PBX will rule them all kind of hack. This was a large financial institution. Um, <clears throat> that had a lot of different um, a lot of different technologies in play, some new technologies, but some like ancient technologies. Um, in the course of like testing this institution, you know one of the things that you normally want to do is kind of dial the the <clears throat> the space. Um, sometimes you do it just to voicemail surf. Um, and and see who's out, who's in, uh, who's doing what, what people's names are, and you know things like that. A side benefit of just kind of calling random numbers and and listening is sometimes you run into something where you get a modem tone. Well, <clears throat> in doing this, um, you know, I called a number, got a modem tone, and just a. a a weird like kind of series of characters and uh, um, and a, a login prompt that was kind of generic, but kind of dissecting like uh, the the series of characters and and what we got back from the modem over making like several calls, figured out that it was um, an old Siemens Rome PBX. Well, um, <clears throat> in this case. That's great, uh, you know, you get a PBX kind of manual. Um, it turns out that uh, they changed the administrator password, they changed the user, the opera password on it, um, but there was one account that um, actually had better credentials than administrator, it was a field tech account, and they didn't change that password. When you get into the field tech account, it actually lets you go into like any user account that you want. The so went into the Rome PBX as administrator and, you know, just kind of browsed that. Um, having, like, done some voicemail surfing previously, I knew that um, the extension for the help desk. So one of the features is to, like, clone a, um, a voicemail box. So one of the things we did is created a new extension, cloned the voicemail box, for the corporate tech support. And at the end of the day, we'd kind of listen to the various messages. Well, it turns out that like there was um, some dude that was traveling on the road and called in frantically to tech support after hours um, when they weren't picking up. 
asking a problem uh, about a VPN problem. It just so happens that in a previous life, I was a certified checkpoint instructor, and I happen to know a lot about checkpoint. Um, in a previous life, if I actually like sat on help desks and did like checkpoint like um, managed services. And the problem he was describing, I knew exactly what it was right away. It was a stupid like settings problem. So I actually just called the guy back. Um, <laughs> I called the guy back and I walked him through like his problem. First I asked him for his username, then I asked him for his password. <laughs> you know, so that I can check and verify his account. And then I fixed his machine. <laughs> um, afterwards, like, you know, he logged in and, you know, <clears throat> he logged out and uh, bingo, uh, I, I logged in as himself, bang, free credentials. Um, the funny part about that was um, in the wrap up of testing, we found out that this guy actually sent um, an email to the head of tech support, like praising them for like the wonderful tech support they got. <laughs> and the quick responsiveness of the tech. <laughs> so that one, uh, that one was kind of awesome and freaky and weird. And um, you know, sometimes you just kind of have to think outside the box but you know something stupid like you know not realizing that hey the the field tech has their own like super account on this piece of antiquated technology can uh, you know have kind of severe implications so <clears throat> okay. well uh, this penetration test on the reality happened at least three or three times uh, similar wishes like this one. Uh, well, we were doing an internal penetration test and the, during the, imperna, the internal penetration test, uh, the network segmented uh, was very limited. We, have, uh, we had almost a, very few things to test, like one uh, open SSH server, very well updated, uh, one Samba server that's almost without sharing, no, 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 no folders, nothing, and a Windows box, uh, or a few Windows box that just block the everything except the ping, like like the echo request and the echo response. Uh, also, VLAN attack bypass or VLAN hoping was not possible on this specific customer and neither on this other two or three that he used a similar attack during the last year. However, ARP spoofing that everybody knows and it is very common was, uh, was present, it was possible to, to be executed, but it gave no juice. We couldn't get any credential or anything in special. Uh, however, during the, the previous penet external penetration test, we figured out that this customer had an external site in a data center that had a VPN, a VPN SSL. And this external VPN SSL uh, used a self-signed certificate. And they used this a lot, but we couldn't compromise during the external. So during the internal, we saw some uh, traffic over the SSL port. And we did a HTTPS uh, man in the middle. Since it was a self-signed certificate, probably the users uh, did not figure out the difference. Uh, when we dumped the contents, we saw connections to this external uh, VPN SSL server with self-signed certificates. So we just got the cookies and the cloned in our box uh, with a burp suite and he accessed again the same external uh, data center server. And as a result, we get a successful login on the holy uh, VPN over SSL, getting access to file servers, uh, applications, and a lot of stuff that was not uh, accessible before, including uh, credit card data and a lot of interesting stuff. So it's very 
uh, interesting demonstration of how sometimes a vulnerability that you couldn't exploit from the external side and is not easily detected by the automated tool can be exploited, for, ex for, for example, from the inside network. It's kind of interesting because we could reproduce the same kind of vulnerability at least in three different customers during the last year. So this kind of vulnerability is the kind of vulnerability we would like to, to, to show you. They are kind of free, different, <coughs> Uh, and not easy to find with automated tests and stuff like that. Yeah, and that's always interesting because you're taking um, <clears throat> you're taking an external, uh, you know, and organizations tend to think of the perimeter is the perimeter and the inside's the inside, and you know we need to secure the perimeter and and the things that we do to secure the perimeter, um, you know, that's out there. And you know that's basically our wall against the the big bad internet. And inside, we need to do different things. But like Wendell said, you know, <clears throat> as a um, as a malicious attacker uh, or a malicious insider could use in external systems just as easily, um, <clears throat> you know, against internal uh, resources. There was a <clears throat> there was um, a, another instance of something like akin to that, where we were taking a look at um, a, a phone directory, and <clears throat> from uh, the inside of a network, and we're just able to basically get like names of people. However, on the outside, there was actually like an HR system with a vulnerability, but you had to have like uh, people's name and their like HR code. Well, when used with the phone directory inside, it had the HR code and the vulnerable app from the, uh, the outside, you know, gave enough information to kind of go through and like actually get like HR data from every single user at that company, including the uh, CEO's payroll information. So um, those are always interesting. And it's interesting because somehow it was internal that you have to compromise external to come back to internal. Mm -hmm. this, one, uh, <clears throat> this one makes no sense. And we're still trying to figure out how this even worked. Um, but <clears throat> we were taking a look at a card processor um, for actually like an entire country um, that processed most of the, uh, the MasterCard and Visa um, transactions. And um, <clears throat> They had a transaction switch that they couldn't touch that was from the card brands, and there was kind of a, a war of, uh, we suspect that's not secure, no it's not, yes it is, no it's not, yes it is, kind of thing. Um, and it was uh, uh, very much, you know, they said this, they said that, kind of going back and forth. Um, the best they could do is kind of like build a wall around it, so because of their um, you know, their idea that it wasn't very secure, they put some very restricted firewall policies in place. They were using some weird old, like, uh, technology that, as it turns out, was very misconfigured. Nothing would get through to the transaction switch. It was kind of set down, and you could only actually, like, reach it from a, a couple uh, stations inside that were kind of like the major databases. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I was getting at. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so what he's saying is, then that's exactly what we found out is, so they spent all this time like building this firewall around it on like this legacy equipment. And, you know, basically, like, things source from port zero, like, being a wild card on a legacy stack, um, it, like, actually kind of sailed right through. So it turned out that, um, you know, the, the people that said, like, no, it's not, 
uh, secure was actually right because um, sourcing traffic from port zero, we found out a webmin interface on this transaction switch with an admin admin user pass pair. That's awesome. That's always the thing that you want running every financial transaction from your country from. Um, and, um, you know, because of that, like, uh, you know, the webmin interface, they're able to get in at, at an OS level and um, basically, like, you know, see uh, processing for the, basically the whole country. So. <laughs> This one's really funny. All right. So, <laughs> um, there was an external pen test, uh, you know, just as an outside in kind of thing. Very few services, a couple uh, applications. There was an administrative like web interface. And it was um, some cheesy thing we thought might be vulnerable, but, you know, we were able to get like uh, some of the code to leak and, and things like that um, enough so that you know you could Google it and, and kind of search for it. So it turned out that um, that led us to uh, looking at like comments and, and metadata in there. We actually found um, a news group where the uh, the administrator actually like posted like huge snippets of the source code for it, and, as well as like all of his information. It was very very chatty on the news groups. Um, unfortunately, that didn't get us much. Um, you know, so looking through like the snippets, like you know, you think like bingo, I have like source code here. You know, surely I can get like something from that. It it didn't end up getting much. However. Um, we ended up like uh, looking up the guy by name and, and we found his Facebook page and like, you know, like nicknames and, and a bunch of stuff about it, which led us to a forum called Caucasian Asian Love. <laughs> and um, it was a forum for uh, Caucasian men to uh, find Asian women to love. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, so this guy had a full profile on there. <laughs> Apparently he was really, really into it and really, really active in the, uh, the Caucasian Asian love. So um, anyway, we ended up building up a, a word list from his dating profile and um, <clears throat> his password was a variant of love machine with the uh, common U spelling of love, <laughs> which was actually rather awesome. Um, so we ended up getting into the administrative interface, which actually like uh, yielded like a ton. So. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Well, it was another external penetration test uh, where we couldn't find it any trivial vulnerability. Uh, basically, no kind of web vulnerabilities, no vulnerable services, no weak accounts, no things like that. Uh, it was a huge network. Uh, and we found that on this huge network, they had almost 20 high definition IP cameras. And they also uh, a specific port uh, that was unrecognized by network mapper. Uh, that probably was the, the application to centralize all these IP cameras uh, into, a, into a single service. Well, uh, these IP cameras, we looked around the well-known vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability databases, and we couldn't find any well-known vulnerability. So we just uh, looked for a copy of these uh, IP cameras, and in a lab, we tested them, and we find the, a few vulnerabilities, like uh, authentication bypass, that uh, allowed us to dump the whole the password uh, from the, uh, a Linux-based system inside the IP camera, and a lot of stuff. We cracked the local uh, root password and stuff. On the end, we created a modified firmware, and we uploaded over this interface, and they created a web shell. 
from this web shell on the web, uh, the web camera. They was connected on the inside network, and it consequently from these web cameras, we could look, for example, uh, internal employees working, give zoom up to 10 times, get screenshots, uh, IP of systems, usernames, and the obviously from the web shell we created it on the modified firmware, you, we could access the whole internal network that was accessible from this IP cameras network that was on the management administrative segment. It is interesting because it resulted uh, in advisory. So we used the, the all penetrate, the all video cameras, that's a security service. Mm -hmm. The, the great thing about that one is you take a look, um, once you're into these video cameras, and these were like, um, by them having like the good video cameras instead of like the like crappy grainy like black and white ones, it really helped a lot because like you had an optical zoom of, uh, of 10 times and um, some of these were trained on like machines and keyboards and things like that. So it ended up becoming like a password bonanza as you like kind of just sat there remotely in a different country um, watching a user like kind of like sit down at a station and, and type in their password. And I'm like, okay, um, so that username has this password. And you know, throughout the day, um, you end up like collecting a bunch of stuff and um, <clears throat> then it, once you have credentials, the, the stuff on that hardened exterior, um, you know, with the various servers that you can do much with, isn't really like so hardened anymore. Um, you know, you can kind of, uh, a lot of password reuse is uh, problematic and all pervasive. So, um, you know, it, it, <laughs> it tends to uh, lead to compromise that way. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So after this one, we have a video to show yeah. you of um, you know exactly how this all works. But I'll let Wendell uh, describe it first. Yeah. And do you want to like sure. come here and then I'll hand you this? Sure. Sure. All right. Go for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, personally, uh, I really like database security. And the, we commonly find raw BI and the old guys on the internal network penetration test. We see a lot of database, SQL Server, Oracles, DB2, and the MySQL, and a lot else. Well, sometimes we can compromise them with different techniques, uh, overflows, weak accounts, uh, problems like bad TNS uh, configured services, etc. in Oracle. However, sometimes we can get like ARP spoofing, uh, but no new connections, not people reconnection, or they have strong passwords, so we can't get the uh, decrypt the credentials during the spawn time of the the engagement. And that's a frustrating thing. You, sure. You're in the middle and and you're seeing all this stuff and, and you wish you could do something with it and you know it's like well I have all these sessions going why can't I just grab one? So um, that's what Wendell and Steve did. They wrote a tool yeah. to uh, basically uh, all right this is an already authenticated session let's just go ahead and grab one. Yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Also big thanks to Steve uh, to work with this with us. He mm -hmm. did a great job. And uh, TicNet also supports SQL Server. So the main idea is if you have the, the sessions running for Oracle or even SQL Server, why force them to reinject, uh, to disconnect and get credentials or whatever, if you can just uh, take, take this connection and uh, send your all commands and do whatever we want. So uh, as you know, we can show screenshots of this penetration test we are talking about because they are a customer and the, it's not a good thing. But we created the uh, in-house video just to demonstrate how it works. We used it recently a lot in different internal penetration tests with a good level of success. And the tool also is free and available on the internet for who is interested. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead and explain what's happening while sure. it's running. Oops, it's off the screen, I guess. Oh, it is. Okay, so we start off with uh, this tool called BAMP that um, actually like does the ARP spoofing. It's a, it's a Perl script that does kind of like some reverse ARP spoofing. Um, with BAMP, then you'd run this tool called ThickNet. <clears throat> and now we are just showing a normal connection to Oracle database from a supposedly client. This virtual machine is like a, a client that you want to access. He's first showing uh, that we can't log in with the, the credential. Uh, Wendell at the database, as you can see on the first line. Then it logged with the user Steve, that's a valid user. So Steve is uh, executing a very simple uh, query, like select one, two, three from the wall or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now back to TickNet. If you use the LS command, we can see the active sessions. And the one is marked with the I letter, that means that it's injectable, it was detected, well, detected as injectable by TickNet. Mm -hmm. So, is it playing? Yeah. All right, so the next thing you do is you actually like go ahead and, and use ThickNet to steal the session, it's a real easy thing. Um, and um, basically what you end up with is taking that session over the normal user just reconnects. Um, in most cases, they don't know that anything really happens. It just is kind of like a blip. Um, and a lot of like uh, database clients have connection pools. Anyway, so you know they just start a new connection. You take their old one and um, basically end up with um, a, a shell interface to the, the Oracle database. Yeah, at this point, we could, for example, send any comment sign, see, we uh, stealth, uh, we stolen the connection. So just to demonstrate, we are sending this SQL uh, query that you'll be creating an account that's called the Wendell, that on the beginning of the video was not an account that existed on the database. As you can see, you get on the end the ORA error 01003. This means that the command was sent and the parcel successfully. Now we are just stopping the RP poison and making sure vape, VAMP makes sure that we are not breaking uh, the ARP tables. And now we are trying to log in again with the same account that was Wendell, just to make sure it really works. We use the VAMP to intercept and injecting a live connection and to create a new account on the Oracle database. Now, as you can see, we can log with the account that previously uh, doesn't exist on the, on the database. And then now we can do any query like the privilege of this account. And as you see, we're just kind of doing a select query. Yeah, just to demonstrate uh, that it's possible to execute any query. Obviously, in this case, uh, the session that was stolen was an administrative query, uh, administrative account. So we could create an account, but you can always get the privilege of that account. For example, recently uh, on our team meeting, we got another guy from the, the network penetration testing team. Hey, man, it's very nice to, last week we got, I stole an SQL server, Microsoft SQL server with this tool, and I could use the uh, XP CMD shell to execute commands just from a stolen session. Also, uh, we have other nice things from TickNet, like steel credentials, and even uh, Microsoft has some very specific, uh, Oracle has some very specific stuff from Windows clients that leak uh, Windows authentication. So I suggest every, everybody to, that is interested to check TickNet. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Is that it?
There we go. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. We are done. Thanks. All right. Great. Um, whoa. <laughs> All right. Um, things are going insane here. Oh. Whoa. Okay. So technology is against me. <laughs> Okay, so it's time to uh, you know talk about some of the uh, the victims of these attacks because they all have very serious implications. You know, they make for uh, kind of like fun stories and and you know sometimes funny. You get a chuckle out of them, but um, let's talk about um, none of these attacks really led to anything trivial. The the reason um, you know why they're included here is all of these attacks led to um, ginormous compromises of, of huge amounts of data. You know, in, in some cases, um, CHD in, in the numbering in the millions, um, PII numbering in the millions, um, and huge, huge, huge um, amounts of data. So the organizations that, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about here are multinational banks, uh, global restaurant franchise, major retail chains, credit card processor for an entire uh, nation. And the, uh, the types of data stolen that we're talking about here is, um, you know, every Visa and MasterCard transaction processed in an entire country, um, hundreds of millions of uh, pan and track data, HR data, um, in one case, uh, you know, it led to accessing like uh, the DHS terrorist watch list for financial institutions that they're uh, supposed to check against. Um, and, you know, obviously like billions of dollars in, in transactions. Um, <clears throat> so just kind of in conclusion to this, um, before I say something about uh, <clears throat> stuff you didn't see, is um, this talk was uh, focused on, on those complex or uncommon hacks found in, in real environments. Um, some are in very high-end and important systems, um, and some are unlikely but true. Um, and <clears throat> This is, you know, uh, a bizarre world where you have like old ancient anomalies, um, you know, like affecting like newer systems, um, security systems that are used to hack organizations, um, you know, <coughs> new uh, techniques developed on the fly and, and things like that. So, um, you know, we're happy to be here. Hopefully you enjoyed these stories. Um, so, I think uh, one of the things that uh, we were going to do with this is we spent like two weeks setting up like this whole like hacking challenge that we're going to run during the talk. And um, so, you know, we checked on it when we got here, we checked on it last night, checked on it this morning and like three machines that we had like wouldn't boot. <laughs> and that's just awesome. Um, so, you know, the, the winner 
was uh, supposed to get a prize. Yeah. And um, so we still have the prize. <laughs> we have a few prize. <laughs> um, but I know like a lot of you out there have like bizarre and weird stories of their own. So we're going to change it. Anybody that comes up with just a truly weird, fucked up story <laughs> will get the prize. True. Of a uh, Duke Nukem Forever. PC version game. <laughs> this guy. Anybody want to take a shot? Come on up. <laughs> well, yeah, the yeah. <laughs> we're we're showing you that we have the game today, but you won't actually get it for another 12 years. Have a seat. Thanks. What's your name? Tim. Tim, what's your weird, fucked up story? Well, we were doing a pen test one time, and uh, we were war dialing all their, all their, you know, phone lines. And like you, we found a system that was returning odd characters. And uh, basically, we were able to determine that this was an HVAC control system. And so, did some research and found that there was a default. Uh, technician login, got into the HVAC control system, and then uh, we, we shut down the exhaust fan in their server room. <laughs> so then we just sent somebody out dressed up as an HVAC technician, and we're able to get right into the data center. What do you guys think? Did Sim get the prize? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. There you go, man. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Well, wait. Wait. No, 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 no. Wait. Does anybody else? Like, I saw a couple people that were kind of coming towards this stuff. Anybody else want to try for the runner up prize? Anyone? All right. Well, um, in that case, I'll drink the cachaça myself. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone um, hope you enjoyed it and uh, thanks for coming Thank out you.